It's 12 12 18. Uh, I didn't piss off the Euros because it's 12 12, no matter which way you prefer the day and the Their month. opinion doesn't matter. <laughs> Sorry, Euros. But we are closing in on the midpoint of December. Those of you who are Christmas oriented, pro Aspie tip. Now's the time to order things. Because <laughs> otherwise it's probably not going to get there. Because I know time. you're not going to go to a store, right? Yeah. Oh, man, I've been going to the store a lot recently because of the new house. And it is just infuriating. <laughs> I can't stand those crowds. It's, it's insane. I, I still don't understand where those people are the other 11 months of the year. The really frustrating thing is that you go to the store and most of the stuff the store has is crap and you can get better stuff online. And it's like, why is it always that the, there's better stuff online than there is in the store? Well, I'm buying stuff like shower curtains and I, yeah. know, things like that. And it's just like, you don't think that you, you, I never realized I needed all that crap until I'm like, oh, wait, I don't have this thing at this house yet. Better go get it. So Think uh, Geek sells shower curtains. As does Amazon. Those are Hideously overpriced. <laughs> you insane. Actually, I, I got to remember to take my sheets are downstairs. I got to get those. Uh, so maybe I don't know if the biggest news this week, but the big hardware news is the uh, the AMD leak. But I, I'm going to tell you, these prices, the, no way, <laughs> no way. These are the prices. It's insane. Uh, so Forbes has the article. I think Adored TV on YouTube was the the, the original source of information. There's a, there's a credible leak out there, and uh, Jim did some pretty good analysis and uh, that kind of thing on if it's true. But the Forbes headline is huge leaks reveal AMD's Ryzen 3000 series up to 16 cores and 5.1 gigahertz frequencies. These this generation of CPUs from AMD would seem to fully embrace the whole like chiplet microarchitecture, meaning some of the chip is fabricated on seven nanometer for the things that seven nanometer does best. And some of the things on the chip are fabricated using older processes, things like I, a memory IO and, and uh, you know, infinity fabric IO and peripheral IO, that sort of thing on an older process. So if you look at the prices here, we're going to see eight cores on AM four and just all sorts of crazy, crazy stuff. I, I'm optimistic, but let's not forget how optimistic everybody was with the whole, um, you know, Vega thing. Well, speaking of Vega, even more unrealistic <laughs> are the the leaked video cards. Because we're talking about a $250 GPU that's going to be on par with the 1080 GTX. Yeah. That's, no. <laughs> it does seem unlikely, but I would say that it depends on when it's going to come out. So if AMD is targeting $250 for the 2070 after the 2070 has already been on the market for a year, around $300 is not completely insane. Well, it also depends on, I think, how much of that inventory NVIDIA gets through. Yeah. Because until they get through that, of course, if this does come out and it really is these prices, that is such bad news. How... Puckered, do you think the anuses at NVIDIA are this week? <laughs> I don't think that they're, uh, they've got such market share that I just, I don't think that they're really even that worried about it. I don't know. I mean, I think this could definitely push somebody to AMD. I mean, 250. Yeah. I yeah. mean, for 2070 levels of performance, I mean, that's, that is pretty nuts. And it remains to be seen what they're going to do with the whole ray tracing thing. But the ray tracing thing is honestly not as revolutionary as it was when, like, the Voodoo 2 came onto the market or when other... I mean, remember, yeah. like, going from, like, a regular graphics card to the Voodoo and it was like, wow, I have, I'm willing to pay a premium for this. Yeah. Good Lord. That was Quake and that was just like, what's going on here? Uh, but ray tracing, I don't think there's been a killer game. No. The killer app for ray tracing. <laughs> Battlefield? Doesn't exist yet. Yeah. <laughs> And people, Snicker. well, like those kind of FPS type situations, people are going to turn that off if they're serious about the game. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't think that's going to be a selling point. So if AMD, even if they're not doing ray tracing on the level of the, the RTX stuff, for 250 Yeah, that's a good deal. People are going to take it. It's too good to be true. Wait and see. Yeah. Well, speaking of things that may be too good to be true, <laughs> how about the Intel's lithography? Now, they have, they claim that 7 nanometer... Okay, 10 nanometer is a disaster, right? It is a dumpster fire. But 7 nanometer is apparently a beautiful sports car sitting next to the dumpster that's perfectly <laughs> fine. 
So Anentech has the article here, the Intel EUV enabled seven nanometer process tech is on track. And so this article details some of the differences between Intel's 10 nanometer process and Intel's seven nanometer process. And one of the differences is the wavelength of light used for the process. And there's a whole bunch of other technical details. They say that the 10 nanometer process is actually going to be simpler for a lot of reasons than the seven, I mean, than the 10 nanometer process. So the seven nanometer process is going to be simpler from a manufacturing standpoint than the 10 nanometer process. And I no longer trust Intel because they have said some very misleading things about the 10 nanometer process and like where exactly it is in the pipeline. And so here they show up and they say, look, the people working on seven nanometer, it was a completely different team. They were working out of a completely different building. And yeah, those 10 nanometer bozos were just, I mean, they stopped short of literally saying that, you know, the 10 nanometer people were just going to throw them directly under the bus and tell the bus driver to step on the gas but the seven nanometer people are our heroes. But then it sort of go on to say, well, seven nanometers is probably not going to be out for about four years. Yeah, that's the thing about it. It's on track, quote unquote, but the track has a long way to go. So, I mean, if you're, you know, what are the odds that most of the people in the upper brass just be gone in four years? <laughs> it's easy. It's like being a politician. You can promise stuff now and let it be the next person's problem. <laughs> well, we've talked a lot about... Uh, Comcast and their hidden fees. We talked about their hidden fees last week. We talked about the many of the cable companies just straight up lying to you in their advertisements. You know, 1999 is not 1999 ever when it comes to <laughs> internet and cable service. AT&T traditionally has maybe been a little bit better but mm, things might be changing. <laughs> Gizmodo has the headline, AT&T will now keep your money if you cancel TV or internet in the middle of a billing cycle. I, uh, so if you, you know, it used to be the case that if you, you set up your service to cancel on the 15th of the month, you would only be billed for 15 days of service. They, they call that prorating. And i tried to, I did a little bit of research. I tried to find it. I think this stems from some court cases in the 60s because in the sixties, because AT&T was doing a lot of stuff like this. And, uh, some of these practices led to the breakup in the, in the eighties, the monopoly breakup in which they promised not to do things like that or to have prorating. And I tried to find the details about if this is by law or if this is something they agreed to. And I think it was just something they agreed to do to try to keep the regulators off their back that now they're just saying, you know, it's been long enough. Now that article says uh, it's actually going to, like, it's not just middle, it's day two. Yeah. If you cancel day two, that's you. Now, of course, you keep the service. So you get to continue using your service for that month. But you will ne never get money back. And yeah. if you're canceling, you're usually canceling because you're moving or you don't have the equipment anymore or something like that. So what good is the service? Well, it's inconvenient, though, because like if you're if you are moving over the course of a month, it's like I'm starting the move on the first, but I will be sleeping at the new place after the 15th. You could schedule it perfectly and to save a little money. I mean, two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars for the communications bill is not atypical for an American per month. And so going from, you know, 200 to 400, 300 to 600, uh, to, for the overlapping service, that's a lot that most people can't afford. Now you can actually, you can switch your service if you were going to keep it. You can also transition that money to another AT&T service, but you just can't get it back for any reason. Yeah. Or switch providers or something like that. Well, Apple, we haven't talked about a, an Apple failure for a little while, have we? We talked about the butterfly switch failure. That was, yeah. Well, that was that's been a couple months ago, hasn't it? Yeah. So yeah. we're definitely due for one, and here we go. <laughs> and this really isn't new news. This is just a new lawsuit. <laughs> Nine to Five Mac has the headline: Class action suit alleges iMac and MacBook lack dust filters, causing display and performance problems. So I think that the 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 uh, the peasant class is starting to realize that maybe the emperor is naked. Yeah, I also wonder though, like, is this a really widespread problem, or is this somebody who's belt sanding? Next to their <laughs> no, it's a, it's definitely a really widespread problem. The the new um, the uh, iMacs that have a built-in Vega graphics card, uh, Lewis Rossman has some teardown. I think it's Lewis Rossman has some teardown videos on those and those are you know just from daily use they accumulate dust like crazy just well, in a normal household i think this is specifically about the monitors where 
the dust will literally get into the display. And yeah, there's nothing you can do. And yeah, it's just you know, you're, it's not a dead pixel. It's just your dead flesh. Yeah, that's blocking. Now, so. It used to be on the old 27 inch IMAX. They actually had a little layer of rubber around the screen, and the glass was held on magnetically. So if you wanted to, you could just pop the glass off and clean it and put it back, and it wasn't really a big deal. That sounds like the antithesis of an Apple design. <laughs> you mean it wasn't super glued or you know welded? Uh, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. They, if you're one of these people, they are seeking more participants for the class action suit so <laughs> if you've had butterfly switch failures i mean that was just kind of the last straw because you know you get the <laughs> i know somebody that has a macbook pro that's barely a year old and whenever they start doing any kind of light duty it sounds like there's a, a dremel tool going off because it's that zzz, zzz, it's just really struggling and it's because he has cats <laughs> you got to think that most hipsters have cats right? yeah i mean i'm yeah. a cat lover maybe i'll get some cats <laughs> but you recognize that Apple people probably have a lot of cats. You'd think in the engineering room, they would just have a, a shelter, you know, just to see how that works out for them. Well, we talked about uh, Facebook and how clandestine you have to be to communicate within Facebook so the you know, big brother doesn't hear what you're up to. And it seems like among the big tech companies, that's not unique. <laughs> Business Insider has this. It's like, FU leakers, a former senior Google employee, says a frantic quest to stop internal info getting out is now management's number one priority. This is, of course, fallout from the Chinese search engine Dragonfly. The fallout here is that people in Google were working on this, and they want to work on this. They want to work with the Chinese government for business interests or new markets or whatever. But a lot of the employees at Google have a problem with that uh, ethically. And so they want to make sure that the left hand does not know what the right hand is doing so that they can take on those projects without really anybody knowing what's going on or being able to answer an inquest or being arrested in another country full of documents that they maybe shouldn't have had that then turn out to be really embarrassing. Talking about Facebook now. Yeah, and uh, the Dragonfly thing, we learned last week that the privacy, data privacy guy was not invited <laughs> to Dragonfly meetings. After raising some objections. Because they knew that, you know, he might do something crazy. So I was like, just exclude him. And it, it seems like not only are they doing that, but they're sort of terrorizing the workforce yeah. and saying, hey, if you leak, we will come after you. The article describes them as being sort of consumed by it. Like it's the number one priority of all these executives. It's like, uh, forget innovating and all that other stuff. We must destroy the leakers. <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of like a you know, kind of a Moby Dick type situation. Yeah. And the other thing, the other bad news for Google is their shadow workforce. Now we've talked about this in the past. Uh, places like Amazon with their delivery and their warehousing. Uh, a lot of companies do this with IT. Yeah. You don't actually work for Google or Amazon or HP or whoever. You work for some, you know, ridiculously named company who contracts with these people. And you are not a full citizen. No. Uh, CNBC's article is, Google's shadow workforce of contractors demands higher wages, equal benefits, and so on, in a letter to CEO Sundar Piachi. So um, these are the contractors at Google. They're, they're, there's a term for them, TVCs, I think. Um, and so those are temporary, contracted, or something else type workers. It's oh. The V is just part of the first one. So it's, it's the temp workers and the contractors. That's how it encompasses. And... Um, the uh, the situation at Google is that they're not treated anywhere near the way that real Google employees are, but they're doing enough work that they feel like they should be. Yeah. So probably true. A lot of like when you talk about the you know the IT people and the delivery people, they're doing the same work. They're just simply not given the same treatment. The one of the big things that talk about they're not allowed to go to the the Friday meetings which is where they've, you know, the, the town hall meetings, the leaks are coming from. So it, those are probably related. <laughs> the big thing here. And it's like, okay, I can kind of understand, you know, it's like, listen guys, you, you're not Google employees. You didn't make the cut. We're going to throw you some table scraps. <laughs> Be happy with what you get. But here's, here's one that they can't <laughs> explain. Remember the YouTube shooter? Hmm? They didn't tell these guys about her. <laughs> The regular employees got a notice. It was like, get out of the building. There's a shooter. These guys were just working away. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> and Google's response was, oh, we told your employer. <laughs> so. Ew, that's that a little one's, rough. That's a little weird. <laughs> and our next story, this is a, a little bit of a non-story, but definitely not something that the anti-leakers at Google want to be a headline. <laughs> the New York Post has the article, Google Employee 22 Found Dead Inside of New York City Headquarters. But the headline for us is not the headline, but the fact that this is a headline. I mean, it's unusual for somebody that young to die, and they, they don't have any kind of history of, according to the thing, they don't have any kind of history of drug abuse or, or anything like that. They just, they just died. And so it's unusual for somebody to die that young, sure, but just because it happens inside a Google office doesn't mean that it's newsworthy. Yeah, and... You, the first thing that came to my mind when I saw that headline, that's the reason I, I included the story before I read it, was like, you know, 100-hour work week and like those Japanese guys who just die playing World of Warcraft. <laughs> but they didn't have, I didn't think there was no mention of that. Yeah. It doesn't seem like he was necessarily overworked or worked to death. He just happened to die while he was at the Google office. And somehow it becomes a story for the New York Post. That doesn't make sense. Well, you know, it is a, it's a catchy, listen, it got me. <laughs> they clickbaited me. I was like, oh, well, let's find out about that. Well, there's nothing to find out about. Wow. And the next story, again, we're talking about Apple. Should I put these together? Also clickbait. Well, it's true, but is it surprising? No. I mean, I think most people who know about technology are pretty aware of this. <laughs> Your Apple products are getting more expensive, and here's how they get away with it from the Washington Post. So it talks about how people that want to frequently replace their devices are getting hit the hardest because the devices are actually getting quite a bit more expensive. But it also points out that Apple does offer lower cost options. You can get the cheaper stuff. But these Apple hipsters, again, they're not buying into technology. They're buying into the brand and the lifestyle. And the lifestyle has been sold to them as have the best stuff all the time. Yeah. So they buy the $1,200 iPhone. And they're happy to do it. Even, Even though it's only marginally better than the $600 iPhone. And is rising way above the rate of inflation. Yeah. You're getting basically the same stuff. Now, Apple will tell you that you're getting all these great new features, so it merits the price. But then they'll sell you a device that has most of those features for $800 or $600. Yeah. But people aren't interested. The, uh, the R version of the iPhone they talked about, that's actually the newest one. But it's not the best one because it's supposed to be a budget version of the iPhone. No one cares. Yeah. No one wants it. Yeah. That's kind of funny. <laughs> that means the price is going to come down. No, I don't know. That means that they're not going to hit their manufacturing targets and it's going to be Harry Carey at Foxconn. Mm. Well, speaking of monopolistic juggernauts, let's talk about Steam. <laughs> but more importantly... A possible competitor to the throne. <laughs> competitor. <laughs> VentureBeat has the headline, Fortnite dev launches Epic Game Store that takes just 12% of revenue. That's that's a big deal because on Steam, it's 30%. And this is going to take just 12%. But if your game uses Unreal, the Unreal Engine 4, I think, the license terms for that on Steam are that they also get 5% of your Steam revenue. But if you go for the Epic Game Store... It's twelve percent, not seventeen. Yeah, nice. So the other thing is, Steam has just recently changed its pricing, and it tiered based on revenue. So if you sell ten million, you get a better share, and then if you sell fifty million, you get a better share. And if you sell a hundred million, you get a huge. They they start taking like five percent, I think, and that of course is great to bring in the big names. To your, because you know we see all these people spinning off their own. They got Blizzard and Activision, and uh, who else has got one? Well, the cost is Ubi, marginal. Yeah. Ubisoft has got one. All of these people have them, and they're all terrible. They're so, all just garbage. So Steam is trying to get those people back. It's like, hey, if you're huge, we'll give you these special rates. But if you're a poor indie developer, you're always going to be in thirty percent land. You know, you're going to sell ten million worth. So maybe an attractive place to go. Yeah. And a lot of people talk about how. You would have to hire someone to do a lot of the stuff that Steam does, like rolling out updates, hosting all that infrastructure. You're getting something for your 30%, but now Epic's going to do it for 12 I bet that Steam lowers their... If, if they start to get any traction whatsoever, Epic, 
um, then I bet Steam lowers their percentage for indie developers. Or they do it where, like, until your first million, the percentage is very low. Well, Epic, you know, they, they quoted in the article, I think they're going to lose money on this. And they're okay with that. Because they actually they were like, you know, we've wanted to do something like this for a long time. It's just not economically feasible. But now there's Fortnite. So <laughs> we're kind of drowning in cash. And we're just doing what we want. The thing that I like about this kind of thing is that Steam is actually not a terrible platform for what it does. They've done a very good job of balancing the rights of the user with, with the other stuff. And I think that it's going to be a long time before Epic is able to catch up to to Valve with something that is as functional and reliable. Well, a lot of people are blaming uh, Bethesda saying, you knew what a just garbage Fallout 76 was. And you knew if you put it on Steam you would lose your shirts to refunds. <laughs> and that's why you didn't go to Steam. That's probably true. And it does point out that Steam kind of goes to bat for the user a little bit, which is nice. <laughs> well, if, you, if you're you know, in a place where it's convenient, you could, uh, you could walk outside right now and you could look up in the sky and you won't see an army of drones, which is incorrect according to Jeff Bezos, five years ago. <laughs> Where are the drones? Amazon's customers are still waiting. So this is from the Associated Press, and these guys are like, wait a minute, didn't Jeff Bezos promise us automated delivery drones? Where are our automated delivery drones? And you got to wonder what sort of trauma these guys have been through that they're demanding this. <laughs> he did, in fact, say five years ago that he thought within five years, delivery drones would be totally a thing. Everybody would be enjoying them. And we do not have them. And we have had some deliveries by drone, but a few, a few human organs, as we learned last week. Yeah, most people don't have access to it. I think in Japan they use them a lot, but they don't have the kind of, like the airspace rules. I don't think as much as so. Maybe some vaporware. I don't know. I think we'll probably get them. I wonder if uh, self-driving cars will further push drones out because that'll make that industry cheaper and more automated. Probably. I can see like pizza delivery happening uh, more readily by a self-driving car with a bunch of pizza slots versus drone. Well, what we probably won't see very much more in the future are gasoline engines, which is <laughs> tragic. I didn't include the story. I said, did you see a uh, Volkswagen the new, they've planned as far as 2026, as far as gasoline driven, diesel driven, driven cars. After that generation, they're not going to do fossil fuel. Yeah, I saw that. I also saw that uh, Elon Musk tweeted that he's maybe interested in taking over those production factories that GM shut down. Yeah. <laughs> so. Course, I wonder if he's just toying with them well, more. Well, then the Musk tweets are. <laughs> who knows? Yeah, you take those with a grain of salt. But. In a lot of places in the EU, you know, the filthy socialists have decreed you just can't drive gasoline engines in our beautiful cities. So what do you do? Well, Aston Martin has an interesting answer. <laughs> Aston, uh, Aston Martin is the luxury car maker. So the Verge headline is uh, that they will make old cars electric so they don't get banned from cities. So your, your classic, classic car that it would be a crime to do anything that dramatic to. It's like, oh, we're going to sell an electric conversion kit so you can still drive this thing around. That one is a 76 uh, something or other. And definitely the people who have those, those are classic. Now they do say it's going to be what they describe as a cassette, which is sort of like you're just going to pop it in and replace the engine. And if you ever want to, you can go back. Mm. I don't understand how that's going to work with like a throttle though. Because these old cars, I mean, the throttle was literally, you know, controlling the fuel. So you'd have to put some sort of sensor in there. And drain the gas tank because you don't want to haul all that gas around for no reason. Yeah, well, I mean, you could just run that out. That wouldn't be too bad. But it seems like it would be labor intensive. Yeah, to switch but it. But reversible, so. <laughs> well, I guess if you're paying for an Aston Martin, you know, $100,000 to swap it between modes is not really a big deal. They did mention that. It's like, <laughs> you know, these people got a few dollars. But uh, I, that's got to hurt the classic car trading yeah. market, right? For One sure. to think, yeah. Can't be good for it. Well, another issue that we have that we will have with self-driving cars, especially if everybody has one and they're low cost, is 
just because the cars are driving themselves doesn't mean there's less traffic. Yeah. And sometimes in a city, something big happens and you have to change the traffic and it can get really bad for a really long time, which is what they're dealing with in Seattle. <laughs> UPS has the answer. <laughs> they're getting ready to open a tunnel, so UPS is worried. But the headline is, UPS tries delivery tricycles as Seattle's traffic doom looms. Now, the Seattle's traffic doom is from, like, they're closing one road to open another road, but for a while, there's not going to be an easy route downtown or something like that. So UPS has these these tricycles, but they are electric assist. So, yeah, so you, you can pedal, but there's batteries. Well, you you operate this this wheel, and I think these, these back ones here, you have a... Uh, a lever so you can apply I think like a 12 mile per hour assist on those and of course that'll be filled with packages 350 pounds worth the uh the range is not great it's like four to 12 miles or something like that so obviously in the city i guess it wouldn't be too bad but yeah got your little rain guard could get cold in seattle yeah i think they're gonna make that change in later december or january or something right so those guys will not be wearing shorts even if you're not wearing shorts <laughs> that's going to be a cold little and it seems like they went sort of like minimalist with the the shield because what if you're behind a truck and it's throwing you know, like slush and salt back at you <laughs> yeah those don't think that those would be good in the snow i guess we'll find out poor ups you know guys. it's going to snow in seattle right I mean, yeah it it's got not. to how could it not well we talked about amazon go the store where you just walk in and pick up whatever you want and walk out and it gets charged to your amazon account I'm excited about that. We'll never see one in no. this part of the world. But maybe those of us in rural places can still enjoy them when we travel. <laughs> Reuters headline is exclusive. Amazon targets airports for a checkout free store expansion. So these are the, the cashierless stores. What better place to put them than an airport? There's people there 24-7. They're looking for stuff. It's like, hey, you got an Amazon account? Come right in. Take whatever. Yeah. And if you can pay Amazon prices... From the website, instead of those <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> airport prices, these will be huge. Yeah. So look forward to that as you travel. They have sort of talk about uh, Amazon really wants to do this, but apparently it's kind of rough getting real estate inside an airport. Mm. There's like a bidding process or something. Yeah. And every time they bid, the airports come back and it's like, oh, we got somebody that beat your bid, but they won't tell them who. So <laughs> it's like, are you just screwing with this? Uh, Don't screw with the Bezos. I think that probably also means that there's not going to be like 50 cent bottles of water in there. Like you you can get on Amazon.com. It's going to be the same old $5. Well, you can't buy an individual bottle of water on Amazon. So yeah. you might be able to get a gallon jug. <laughs> <laughs> can't get that past security. <laughs> well, we talked about Uber. We haven't talked about Uber a lot lately. The, the, the new guy that took over has done a good job of sort of calming things down. But before that happened, we talked about arbitration. If you are unhappy with Uber, just by merit of signing up to the service, and that terms of service that you didn't read, you agreed to arbitration. Mm -hmm. So you can't sue them. But one law firm has found an interesting loophole. Yeah, so the, this story is actually really interesting. It's another Reuters article, and it says, Forced into arbitration, 12,500 drivers claim Uber won't pay fees to launch their cases. So we covered this originally when it was happening. And the court said, okay, you've got the arbitration agreement. And in the in the arguments to that court at that time, a long time ago, Uber said, yes, we're going to pay the arbitration firm the fees, which is like $1,500 to start. And that will kick off the arbitration process. Uber has done that six times. They've gone to arbitration six times so far out of 12500 Yeah, so it costs $1,200 to do. So... The law firm basically was like, hey, we want to do nine test cases to set some standards and we want you to work with us. And Uber was like, no, we're going to do what we want. And they're like, okay, have 12,000 cases that are $1,200 a piece and you have to deal with right now. And their answer was, we're just not going to deal with it. So there is a time limit that I think they've already missed. I don't know what happens there. Well, uh, they may be able to go back the, the the law firm that originally argued in court and where the court said, okay, I guess there's an arbitration policy in place. You can go with arbitration. They may be able to get that ruling overturned because judges don't look kindly on that. If you tell a judge, hey, we've got an arbitration process. We're going to follow through with it 100% and then this happens. If you get the same judge, that judge is going to be pissed off. 
And there's probably no limit of Uber drivers who are upset. Yeah. They'll be willing to just jump in there. So they could cover that amount of money, you know, even 12,000 cases at 1200 a pop. Yeah. Uber could eat that cost. What if it just, if it's constant, yeah, that'll destroy them. So yeah. Yeah. They, they got to do something. New. Bad news for Uber, but smart in terms of that law firm. <laughs> you know what else is smart? The level one store, because I keep forgetting that we got new stuff in there and we forgot to mention it at the start. There's some fine looking water bottles. <laughs> or let's say that you have to visit your family for the holidays, right? And you don't particularly enjoy that. Maybe some holiday spirits. <laughs> that is, uh, what are these, like uh, 16, 17 ounces? Yeah, they're, they're pretty big. That is a <laughs> lot of rye whiskey to uh, get you through. Vacuum insulated, so it'll it'll hold the heat in the cold. I don't think they... They don't care. Those, those drinks don't necessarily need to be chilled. <laughs> well, you might you might also need some spirits if you're holding Bitcoin as well. Yeah, I didn't check the price before we started, but <laughs> it Bitcoin, was hovering just over three thousand. It's really, really just <laughs> plummeting. <laughs> but is, Bitcoin falls ten percent as bad news descends, like cockroaches coming out of a hole, according to Market Watch. And of course, they're talking about ether. Most of the coins are just crumbling. And the Bitcoin cash thing they blamed, I don't think that's it. No. I think this is just, you know, panic selling. If it was Bitcoin cash, Bitcoin cash would be going up and then Bitcoin would be going down. But that's there everything is going down. Yeah. There's there's lower trading volume, there's lower everything across the board. It's probably not just one thing, it's probably a combination of things. Well, I think the euphoria is officially dead. Yeah. And probably we're falling below that line. Like there's probably like a $4,000, $5,000 area where it could be stable. Except now the sentiment is so bad. Yeah. It was stable at six. And now, so five doesn't seem unreasonable. Some people are saying that this is the end. It's going to go to zero. I don't see it going to zero. No. But a lot of people, when they were caught up in the, uh, the tulip mania that was Bitcoin, <laughs> made some really, really bad decisions. And one of those individuals is about to suffer for that. <laughs> the Bitcoin, this is the Bloomberg article, Bitcoin options bought for 1 million will soon be worthless. So this was uh, this was somebody who bought uh, options on Bitcoin if Bitcoin was going to go past 50,000 or something A like that. A $50,000 call for December 28th. Hmm. So on December 28th, if Bitcoin doesn't happen to get to $50,000, oh. <laughs> Boiler Snake, he he sold early. He sold at like uh, eighteen thousand. He loves to rub our faces. Let me tell you. Every day you walk in here, he's like, "Oh, how's that Bitcoin investment going?" And it's insulting, but what can we do? Yeah. But yeah, this guy, uh, if it doesn't hit fifty thousand dollars, then that entire one million dollars will be gone. Yeah. So. Oops. Although one of the guys that was interviewed for this article said that. They were holding Bitcoin and they sold some of the Bitcoin they were holding and then bought this as to like hedge their bets. So if it went down a whole bunch, they're covered. And if it went up a whole bunch, they're covered. And so total, the net on that transaction was still profitable for that individual. But it could have been profitable plus a million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So this was a lottery ticket. If Bitcoin would have went to fifty thousand dollars. The amount of options he would have been able to buy at that at a call that far outside, he would be filthy, <laughs> filthy rich. So, at least it didn't get burned completely. Uh, whoever uh, sold those contracts is so happy. <laughs> They're like, oh, look at this idiot. Well, it was a week of record-setting YouTube viewing, and what not on our channel. Only, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> What would we, I mean, can you imagine if we got to, what was it, 264 million? There would views? be so, the toxic, the comments would be so toxic <laughs> as to be unmanageable. But uh, Variety is talking about the Avengers Endgame trailer smashes a 24-hour video views record. So this is the trailer for the new Avengers movie. The Avengers Endgame is the name of the movie. It's a movie trailer, 200 and some million views. 60-something. In 24 hours. I haven't That's watched crazy. it. Did you watch it? I did. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. But uh, I think we all kind of know how that story's going to end, right? Yeah. I mean, there's only one way it can go. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> but uh, those movies aren't terrible. You know, I, I can't really hate on those. They're predictable, but 
They're fun. When we when we look at the you know David Banner, Lou Ferrigno, Hulk series of the seventies, and like the old Batman series, while they have a certain charm, these are these are actually pretty well done for the most part. Yeah, it superhero stuff is done well when they spend a lot of money on it and take it seriously. I think actually the one of the drawbacks to these movies is the the comedy they try to mix in. Yeah, because it's not that great. Although that. Uh, the rock, the Australian rock monster guy was pretty funny, <laughs> but for the most part, the comedy isn't great. I get they're trying to appeal to children, yeah. But when they take it less seriously, I think it detracts from it a little bit. I think there's also not as much time for character development in the movies. I find that if I were relying strictly on knowledge of the characters from the movie, I would probably find them a lot more hollow and vapid than they well, otherwise are. You got how many superheroes? Yeah, there's just too many of them. There's just not enough time. So I don't know, but I'm sure it'll be a big hit. It'll sell quite a few movie tickets. I won't be one of them. Can you imagine? <laughs> when does that come out? Uh, sometime in 2019. Oh, so that's not a Christmas movie then? I don't think so. Okay. Well. So speaking of YouTube views and our lack of them, <laughs> at least we're not losing to a seven-year-old. Oh, wait. <laughs> YouTube's top earner is a seven-year-old who made $22 million playing with toys. So this is Ryan's toy reviews. Toys review. There you go. There he is. Apparently, uh, you know, he just gets toys and puts them together and checks them out, and people love it. Here he is in a giant inflatable water park thing. <laughs> I mean, that's a charmed life. It is fun to watch a kid enjoy stuff, but I, I worry that when he grows up, he's never going to be able to achieve that level oh, of happiness. Dude, there, there is so much methamphetamine <laughs> in that future. Do you think uh, the parents are... Properly taking care of his money. I don't know. I those, hope so. Those stories are so dark. Yeah. When you're you make a billion dollars as a kid, and then they blow it all on something crazy, and you're famous but broke. Didn't that happen with Macaulay Culkin? Something like that did. I mean, he pulled the nose up because he still was in you know acting and stuff, but he, he should probably be worth a lot more. <laughs> but hey, uh, I disagree. I can't stand to watch children do things. But apparently I'm in the minority here. Because <laughs> it is. There is something. I mean, I get it. There's something wondrous about, you know, watching a child, like, be genuinely happy, but also not making a lot of noise. Well, I think some of it is also because uh, it's not just views. This was income, not views. He's not the top viewed person on YouTube. But those toy companies are probably lining up yeah. to pay. It's like, get me on that channel. Let me send you... Everything I have, the whole toy lineup, and a duffel bag full of money. Yeah, Please yeah. take this from me. Well, I think I think one of Linus's best ever performing videos was him unboxing a toy fire truck just because it, it was completely motorized and had like a motorized ladder or something. It was like the fanciest toy fire truck ever. And for whatever reason, that was in the tens of millions of hits. Well, look at, you know, PewDiePie. It's a, <laughs> if you can appeal to children, then you, that's... Sort of the YouTube secret. Something we don't do at all. We're going to get them as they become angsty teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to get them as they transition from their parents paying for everything to them being penniless. <laughs> <laughs> and us giving them a dose of how and, it is in the real world. And no advertisers being at all interested in them. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, I don't know. Maybe some of you have managed to get past that phase and... You know, you're looking at buying a major appliance. You might want to take a second look before you buy that hot new refrigerator. I think I don't think we've ever recommend. I think every time anything like this has come up, we've always said, "Don't buy the smart appliance." This is ridiculous. This uh, family says that this smart refrigerator can't be repaired yet because it's too high tech. Now, the article implied that it was because like it's got the fancy screen on it and whatever. But when you read between the details, it's because this this fridge uses some kind of new refrigerant that nobody has any idea how to work on. Now, this kind of happened to my parents. They don't have anything that fancy. They just bought a Samsung refrigerator. And because they live in the hills of eastern Kentucky, there are no qualified Samsung repairmen around there. You know, So it broke, and they called uh, whoever they bought it from, Lowe's or whatever, and they're like, oh, you got to call Samsung. So they called Samsung, and Samsung was like, yeah, there's nobody. We can't fix it, so we have to replace it. We'll call you back in three months. <laughs> so We're going to put it on a boat. You're going to have to yeah. pick it up at your local loading dock. And luckily, it's like, this is a landlocked state. Luckily, Lowe's did give them uh, like a loaner fridge, like a crappy fridge. 
and eventually they got it worked out. But like these people, it took forever <laughs> to get the replacement. Lesson learned, don't buy a Samsung fridge. In fact, don't buy something that you either can't work on yourself or is not, you know, overly complicated. Well, I think modern refrigerators, that's a that's a very small list. But don't get the the soup like the top of the line. Yeah. Get the most mass produced model. Um yeah. Because if they had a high failure rate on fridges that a lot of people bought, they would be out of business from having to repair them. Well, not only that, but the people who are around you are going to be able to work on them. Yeah. Or you could just call a repair shop and be like, uh, hey, what would it cost to get this model fixed, even if you don't have it yet? And if they say, we can't work on that, keep looking. Yeah. And if you want to make up the problem, just tell them that it's low on refrigerant. So, China. We've talked about their crushing of the human spirit and their spying and you know the Huawei and all of their political troubles. But here's a good story about China. Some feel good Chinese <laughs> moments. The New York Times is like China is going to launch this to the 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 far side of the moon, literally the dark side of the moon. That's like in that one album. Who who uh, recorded that album? Uh Pink Floyd. Oh that one was pretty easy though. <laughs> So yeah, I almost they, said Leonard Skinner, but I knew that wasn't right. No, that's very different bands <laughs> yeah. from different parts of the world, even. Yeah. So uh, yeah, they're going to launch a. Uh, it's going to be, I think, a third or two thirds the size of Curiosity. Yeah. Their rover. It's going to drive it around. And uh, it's going to do some measurements. It's got like radar and stuff, but not super interesting. One of the cool things it's going to do. It's going to try to germinate potatoes and hatch some sort of insect eggs hmm. just to see if that can happen up there. Neat. So. Well, they'll have to give it an artificial atmosphere, but that should be fine. No, they're tr well, I think that it'll have an atmosphere, but they're, the thing they're thinking about is in that gravity, can that happen? Hmm. So um, Neat. Seems like a potato it could pop out a taproot in zero gravity, right? I would think so. Why not? Well, it's not zero gravity. It's just low gravity. Well, I mean, functionally. So, yeah. Good luck with the uh, the dark side of the moon, which isn't actually dark all the time. Yeah. If you're wondering how you can germinate potatoes in darkness, it's not always dark. It's totally <laughs> locked. <laughs> in before correction. <laughs> well, this is some good news. Maybe a little terrifying, you know, because not, this is going to be a way that... I think insurance companies are going to like demand this. <laughs> yeah. And it's going to be dark. Oh, no coverage. Dystopia. Scientists develop a 10 minute universal cancer test. It looks for markers in your blood, but it's really accurate apparently. Yeah. So apparently the cancer, even if it passes through blood, leaves behind something that will or won't bond to a type of metal or something like that. So what they do is they just pull some blood and they run it through this, and if anything sticks to it or don't, I can't remember which one it was. you remember which one it was? Then they know somewhere in your body. And it doesn't tell them where it is, but it tells them that somewhere in there, there are malignant cells, and they're <laughs> leaving behind this slimy trail. How, how bad is that going to be? It's like you go to the little, the little pharmacy at Kroger, and it's like, oh, yeah, let's just get you some, uh, some cough pills. And, oh, yeah, let's do a saliva test or a blood test here real quick. Oh, you have cancer. It's going to take a couple of weeks for us to schedule for to figure out like where the cancer is and how bad it is. Yeah. That would be a terrifying couple of weeks. Or you know, it's going to be like, hey, uh, you, know, you signed up for insurance. Here's one of those little uh, like diabetic testing finger <laughs> punch things. <laughs> It's so like, send us a swab back. <laughs> if that ever turns blue, you don't have insurance anymore. <laughs> so, uh, but that is good, you know, early detection and all that. So if you can afford it, of course, this is where we get all those comments about, you know, socialized medicine. <laughs> uh. Well, Friday, it's going to be a big Friday because we have not done security. We've not done robots and we've not done nonsense. Wow. That's going to be a bumper crop Friday. Hacked Friday. We've already been dragging on. I think we might have to cut some nonsense stories. It's fine. We'll see you Friday.